Great. Well, thank you very much, Liz, for the introduction. Um, I'm Henry Huntington. I work at uh, Ocean Conservancy. I live in Denina land on the, in Eagle River, Alaska, and had the uh, pleasure and privilege of being the lead author of the Alaska chapter for the fifth national climate assessment. Very happy today to be joined by um, several of our contributing authors and our federal coordinating lead author, Colleen Strawhacker. Um, of the, I, I think we have more uh, authors than are um, sort of officially signed up to be part of the presenting team, but the, the presenters that we have um, in the chapter are Tracy Curry, Kena Ichokiak, and Libby Lagerwell. And uh, what we'll do, I'll go through the, give you an overview of the chapter and then uh, turn it over to each of the four of them to, if they'd like to add anything, and then we can move into Q&A. I apologize for the first slide for having uh, lots of small print, but we had a terrific team working on the on the assessment, and I want to make sure everybody's listed. Um, I think we have everybody except Fred Lipschultz, who is our point of contact, and I, my apologies to Fred for the, the omission. Um, anyway, very strong team, uh, very diverse team in contrast to uh, the Alaska chapter on on uh, several of the, the previous national climate assessments. And that gave us, in my view at least, a, a great range of perspectives and ideas and allowed us to do things a, a little bit differently as, as we were also encouraged to do. Um, I encourage you to look at the chapter. Um, if you wanna see the details of everybody, I won't uh, take our time by, by reading through the whole list. Brief summary. Um, Climate change continues to be rapid, widespread and, widespread and extreme throughout Alaska. Um, there is, of course, tremendous regional variation, but we can see uh, signs of this as reported in previous national climate assessments. And you know, all of that continues, and we have no particular reason to think that's going to change anytime soon, um, at least without you know, serious global action. There are things that we can do, however, to create to address the effects to adapt in Alaska um, and to do things that we think will have lasting benefits today and for future generations. Um, in contrast to previous national climate assessments, which spent more time looking at climate per se, um, we emphasize the social implications of climate change for Alaska um, with a number of examples and then a few recurring themes as may be suggested by the background on the slides of the salmon, thanks to Sarah Glazer and Chugach Regional Resources Commission. Uh, salmon governance and adaptation come through the, the whole chapter. As I mentioned, what's new, this, this version um, of the National Climate Assessment, a greater emphasis on societal implications of climate change. That was a, a charge given to the entire National Climate Assessment. We also looked at the, the, the compounding or intersecting stressors exacerbated by climate change. And what I mean by that is that choose whatever societal issue matters to you, climate change is probably going to have an effect and it's probably not gonna be a good one. So we can't think of climate change in isolation. We need to think of it as part and parcel of, of everything that we know and love and care about. Um, we also in the chapter talk about security from national security to, to local security, food security, environmental security, and so on. And that's a, something new. I don't think the previous versions of the National Climate Assessment had really gotten into, into security issues. So I'm glad that we were able to add that this time around. NCA chapters are organized around key messages. Um, the number is left up, up to us. We wound up with seven. Um, you can read them here. Again, I won't go through, won't read all of these for you, but you can see that we take it from, you know, the, the very local and specific level. I mean, literally our bodies in terms of health in our communities um, through livelihoods, our environment, security, and then finishing with, with adaptation and our, our belief that uh, just and prosperous future is possible if we can start with adaptation and, and, uh, and start working sooner rather than later. As a little background, the introduction does provide an overview of climate. Um, we have a, a, a few figures. I'll present a few of the figures from the chapter now and, and what they tell us. 
uh, the first figure talks about climate-driven extremes and, and notable events. Hardly an exhaustive list, but this is just a, an indication of what's happening and the fact that these are, are happening everywhere in the state and um, in many different ways, whether it's sea ice, water temperature, um, permafrost thaw, changes in, in vegetation, changes in precipitation. Um, I gave a presentation of this a, a little while ago and somebody pointed out that wildfire isn't on here. As I said, not an exhaustive list, but certainly something to give an indication of uh, you know, just how, how extensive and, and serious climate change is. Again, the message is that this is a continuing trend from what we have seen and reported in previous national climate assessments. Um, you know, things are things are continuing, um, unfortunately, as we expected. The counterpart to this comes in the, the key message on our natural environment, looking at the the ecological changes that stem from the climate change we're seeing. And again, widespread throughout Alaska, vegetation, land animals, fish, marine mammals, um, you know, insects, all of the above. Um, and this is a, you know, important observations coming from, from all over. And here I'd like to call particular attention, um, at least, uh, at least one of these, the, the early arrival of trumpeter swans came from the, the LEO network, local environmental observers network run by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. And that's a tremendous resource for observations from all over the state. And in fact, now internationally. Um, of things that are happening in, in the environment, of things that, that people are noticing. And I'd like to give credit for to the LEO network for making that possible and for making accessible a, a tremendous resource. We, we do cite LEO sources in several places through the chapter. Um, and that was, it was really nice to be able to do that, to, to have that set up formally in a way that made it very easy to cite and, and to find. I mentioned this idea of, of intersecting or compounding things or the, the context in which climate change is happening. Um, and our figure two in the chapter gives a couple examples. This is one of them, the other concerns the Denali Park Road. Um, but if we talk about say the, the effect on, on salmon through, through Alaska, again, this is not happening in isolation. It's not that everything else is, is just hunky-dory and, and uh, and so on, but it's happening in the context of community needs and community traditions. It's happening in the context of management and allocation decisions that are being made. It's happening in the context of the research that is going on concerning salmon, concerning communities, concerning marine and freshwater ecosystems, and so on. All of this is what's going on at the same time that the ocean is warming, sea ice is, is being lost, and, and salmon populations are, are changing and, and ranges are shifting and so on. And so if we wanna understand, not only understand the, the implications, but also figure out what we can do, we need to be thinking about all of these different aspects. So we may have a desired outcome. We'd love to see salmon harvest remain robust and, and meet needs that people have. That outcome is going to be affected by climate change impact. It's going to be affected by existing societal conditions, existing environmental conditions, and by limitations to our response capacity. There are some things we can do and some things we, we can't, whether because it's impossible or whether because that's, that's the societal choice we've made on say, where we spend money or how we allocate resources and so on. And those things are important to keep in mind. I think that's an an important thing to understand when we're considering the societal implications of climate change throughout Alaska. The intersection of, of climate change with other things creates challenges, which is that, as I mentioned, climate change is likely to exacerbate many of the things that, that we care about. I give a couple examples. Table, uh, table one in the chapter gives one for each, com each um, key message. Um, I had a slide that had that. Tracy correctly pointed out that that was you know, way too small a font. So we, we just have a couple examples. Um, access to healthcare is inequitable around the state. Climate change is not going to help that situation. And that's the challenge. The opportunity, however, is that by improving public health services, we can benefit, we can help prepare for climate change 
and also do things that will just benefit the state generally. It will benefit people in rural areas, in urban areas, and will help in, in many respects. So it's not an either or choice that either we respond to climate change or we do something else, but it's a question of how we do it in ways that can be beneficial in, in more than one way. Similarly, with, with food insecurity, um, excuse me just a sec. My apologies. Um, you know, food insecurity is a is a major challenge in rural Alaska. High prices, um, transportation and access and other matters. Um, climate change again is going to be changing ecosystems in a way that that can make this difficult and increase the problems associated with food insecurity. But there are things that can help increasing community capacity and agency, their ability to make their own decisions and make their own adaptations and so on can help with, with addressing climate change and also addressing other things associated with food insecurity. So in other words, the, the, again, the, this idea of intersection creates both a challenge and also an opportunity to do things in ways that have multiple benefits. There we go. One thing we, we discuss in this chapter is the fact that in most of the available information and, and research concerning climate change in Alaska and societal implications, we either look at sort of broad general impacts that af affect the, the state as a whole, um, or for obvious reasons, we look at, at effects on native communities around the state. That's all well and good. What we don't do much of, what we don't have much information on, is how climate change is affecting other racial, ethnic, and societal groups. Um, in other parts of the country, we are familiar with, with uh, ideas of, of environmental and climate injustice and so on, and there's evidence for how that, that plays out in, in different communities in different regions. Here, we just don't know that much about it. And this is something that we need more research on, and I'll come back to that later. In this graph, what I'd point to as one example, if you look at the pie charts for in the lower left portion of the map, Kodiak Island Borough, Aleutians East Borough, and Aleutians West Census Area, each of those has a large pink slice of the pie, and that's Asian or Asian American um, people in those areas. So our understanding that many of the, those folks are involved in the um, fishing and fish processing and so their exposure to climate change and their risk from climate change may be greater than, you know, say, people who are, are working in, uh, in other, other parts of the economy. But unless we dig into that, it's, you know, it's hard to say more about that. And we need to understand that to understand what kind of risks are being faced and therefore what kinds of things need to be done in, in terms of adaptation. We also look at uh, effect on employment. Again, this is a, an excerpt from the figure that has some more elements. Um, we know the oil and gas sector is a is a big deal um, in Alaska. You know, whether there are national and international efforts to limit greenhouse gas emissions, you know, that that could have an effect on uh, on oil and gas production. We do know that permafrost thaw is negatively affecting infrastructure, especially on the North Slope. And that's going to be a challenge for the oil and gas industry. Fishing, um, we don't need to say much about that other than it's the biggest sector in terms of jobs statewide, uh, very large uh, in terms of wages. We expect that climate change will continue to disrupt fishing patterns and, and, uh, and we may see more fish stock collapses as, as we have seen. And you know, as is unfortunately the case, some of these events have overtaken what we wrote in the chapter because the climate change is uh, continuing and our chapter was more or less finished up last, uh, last spring. I mentioned uh, national security. Um, we have a, a look at climate hazards related to the Department of Defense sites in Alaska. I would refer you to the chapter. I can't remember what a WAWA score is, um, but this was a, an analysis done by the Department of Defense at the, at the exposure to various climate hazards um, at different sites in Alaska. Permafrost is not listed here. I believe the top row 
are sites that where permafrost is a is a major concern, and the bottom ones are uh, ones where we're not quite so concerned about um, about permafrost top specifically. But you'll notice many of the other um, climate hazards are are uh, very serious for many of these, and this includes even things like the National Guard Wasilla Storefront Recruiting Office. This is a I believe in you know, a sort of a, a, a a space in a strip mall and you'd think, okay, fine, you know, what's the what's the risk? Well, by their analysis, there there is a risk there and it is something to be concerned about. Um, so these are important things to be thinking about you know, if you're if you're planning uh, Alaska assets with, with regard to uh, the national security. When it comes to adaptation, um, you know, we have some examples of things that that uh, that are working. We're also aware of course that there can be a real challenge for communities in navigating a bunch of different agencies, institutions at, at different levels, and trying to figure out how to court align what's available from different agencies and what can be done in cooperation with different agencies and initiatives with a variety of local priorities. And sometimes this is just a matter of, of sort of juggling and and doing what you can, but we see this as a an area for uh, for attention and, and we hope some improvement in making it easier for communities to navigate that system and figure out how to how to make things work better. Uh, I spoke earlier about capacity and, and agency. And this is a, a case of the more the more local communities have a, a say in the ability to do what they think needs to be done, um, you know, that we think gives them a better chance of being able to do that rather than being limited by what uh, you know what's available and in this year from, um, from a given agency. In addition to the main text of the chapter, we each of our uh, key messages is accompanied by a story. These are about 150 words long. They're pretty short, um, but each of them, we hope, gives a little sense of the, the, the human story associated with some of these aspects of climate change. First one, I've been called to pray by Gladys Pangawi, who's the photograph in upper right, um, talking about receiving messages by social media from friends and relatives about people who are traveling. Because conditions are uncertain, because ice is less predictable and so on, the hazards are, are higher and so people are more concerned. You know, that's, a, that's a very real and, and tangible idea of, uh, of climate change. We have more of these. Um, Throughout the, throughout the chapter, and I encourage you to, to read these um, contributed by, by a variety of people and, and uh, we think giving a little uh, you know, sort of personal touch or, or a specific touch of what climate change means in addition to the, you know, the more general information we present on maps like the ones of, of climate changes and, uh, and ecological change. And finally, i just touch on a few research needs. We, talk about this a little bit in the chapter, but um, I will not put these on my co-authors. These are sort of my observations of the what I think um, we need having been through the experience of, of writing the chapter. Um, observations and research are the foundation of a chapter like this. So obviously we need to keep doing those kinds of things. Um, you know, and, I, and I hope that we will. And I don't think you're gonna find too many people who would say, you know, we have enough observations or we can stop looking over here. Uh, it's just a question of how much we can, uh, how much we're willing to invest and, and how we're willing to do it. Again, I'd make a plug for things like the LEO network as a way to expand our collective capacity by drawing on, on the, you know, the intelligence and observation and, and resources and capacity that are already all around the state and uh, in communities everywhere. In addition, I think there are a couple areas that, that struck me at least. Um, one, I mentioned the idea of, of barriers to adaptation. You know, it's easy to spot barriers. I think we can also spend time looking at successes and what's working and figure out how to scale those up. It's great that we have successes. What we often have is a one-off success and it takes a while. So how do we share those messages and how do we get that out and make more things happen? That I think is a is a good question for us. This is an urgent problem. We we can't sort of take our time and try a few things here and there and then gradually spread it, we, we need to, to speed up. Um, I mentioned the question of climate change and various 
racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and other groups. You know, we, I don't think we know that much about the different exposures to um, whether it's by race, ethnicity, whether it's by, say, uh, degree of education or income or, or other factors. You know, we just don't have much to be able to say, say more, to say enough um, to, to be able to understand what some of those differences are and therefore to respond effectively. Uh, finally, the uh, synergistic response options, as I showed in, in table one, you know, we think there are a number of ways that we can respond to climate change in, in ways that affect other things well too. Um, and I think we need to dig into that more and, and better understand how we can plan effectively to address climate change in, in ways that have multiple benefits throughout our society. And these are a, number, a, a few ideas that occurred to me. I'm sure there are lots of other ideas out there, and I encourage you to, you know, to look through the chapter and, and see what inspires you too. Um, that's it for my presentation. Um, I will now ask uh, my collaborators if they have anything to say, and I'm going to do it in the order in which they appear on my screen, which is Tracy. Yeah. Um, thanks, Henry, for that. Great uh, summary. I think one other thing that I would add, or maybe also emphasize, because you you also talked about it, but so focusing on the social implications of change was the charge of the entire assessment report. But I think our team was especially intentional about kind of going beyond describing just like what is changing and and really centering the human impacts of those changes. And um, I think like the makeup of the collaborators, we were really well positioned to do that. A really diverse group of individuals from different research fields and also uh, professionals working in different arenas um, and doing this kind of work in, as their jobs. And um, I'm also really proud of, uh, you know, we took the time to describe the differing nuances of the changes for both rural, the primarily Alaska native communities and our um, increasingly diverse urban communities. As we know, like Alaska is not a monolith and um, and like our, our last key message is mentions uh, having this vision for our just and prosperous future in Alaska. And I think like the way that we get to the just part of that is by analyzing these differences and not overlooking them. Um, so yeah, this chapter, I think I'm really happy with because it does a good job of like highlighting the importance of understanding those differences and nuances and uh, making considerations for the diverse conditions and communities throughout Alaska and, um, and you know, the, the need for solutions that are relevant and also just. Thanks, Tracy. Libby, you're the next one on my screen. Thank you, Henry. Um, yes, hello, everyone. I would echo what Tracy said. Uh, I'm a fisheries biologist, and it was really thrilling to be part of such an interdisciplinary team and to see all the hard work of our agency being applied to this very human problem. Um, I also thought we did uh, made a lot of efforts to write the chapter in plain language, um, informative and accurate, but understandable. And I was really proud of that. I think it reads really, really well. And then finally, I wanna thank Henry for his outstanding leadership. We couldn't have asked for a better uh, chapter lead. He did all the yucky work and let us do all the fun work and kept us all on track. So thank you, Henry. Thanks for that, Libby. Um, it was my pleasure, as I said, uh, Kena. Hello, everyone. I'm grateful to be here with you all today. And I've been really honored to be part of the NCA5 Alaska chapter. Um, I'm from Northwest Alaska. I'm in you back from Kotzebue and I'm enrolled in the Norvik native community. Um, but I also call Kotzebue one of my homes. Um, and one thing that I really loved about working on this chapter is that we came together as Alaskans, you know, and 
we thought about the ways that, you know, Alaska is, is a different place. You know, we subsistence, we have a, we sure we have a cash economy. We saw that 1.7 billion, you know, in wages in the fisheries industry, but we also have a non-cash economy, which is such a big and important part of the livelihoods of our communities and also the cultural upkeep, right? The subsistence that is like part of our culture as Alaskans. And we took a lot of care in thinking about that. And it came when we had our community meetings with, you know, where we got public commentary and people came and, and we had talking and listening sessions, you know, that kept coming up over and over again with Alaskan community members and other stakeholders was, you know, this, we're seeing this stuff with fish, we're seeing these things. And like, it was a lot of observation came from and commentary and care and worry, right, came from impacts on subsistence. And then also what those impacts of subsistence do to people, right, not just our food insecurity, but food insecurity has other like compounding factors and, you know, where it affects, you know, mental health issues or which then is impacted by, you know, disparities in, in healthcare in, in Arctic regions as well, or rural regions in Alaska. So for me, you know, I felt like we did a really careful job of trying to look at a bigger, the whole picture. And instead of working in silos, worked in community. And, and I really was really appreciative of that and that it reflected a lot of what I know as an Inupac to be um, good work. So thank you. Colleen. Thanks, Kenna. Yeah, thanks, Henry. Um, and hi, everyone. So I, um, as the federal coordinating lead author, I really left the content to the chapter authors. My job was really just to um, make sure that we were dovetailing with other um, national climate assessment chapters. So I would really encourage you, um, you know, you're hearing um, in depth about one chapter, which is great. I mean, obviously this one is my favorite too, <laughs> for obvious reasons, but there are a lot of really excellent connections to um, other chapters in the national climate assessment that are linked directly in our chapter. So feel free to take a look at kind of all of those linkages with the rest of the assessment, which is, you know, just such a wonderful document that um, so many people worked really hard on. Um, so if you're able to have time outside of the Alaska chapter, um, take a look at the other chapters too. I'll also highlight that the National Climate Assessment Director is online too, Allison Crimmins, so she's another resource for questions as well. I think she signed on just as we were starting, Henry, before you were doing introductions. So um, Allison is online as well. So um, yeah, and thanks to Henry and all of the authors and technical contributors for um, all of the hard work. It was really wonderful to see the process come around and um, all of the hard work to going into debating over a specific, just one single term um, in a key message, for instance, just to make sure that our language was clear and accurate and reflective of the diversity of Alaska. So that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. And, and I'll add that uh, as you go through the chapter, especially the online version, there are cross references you can click and follow. Uh, that is largely thanks to Colleen, who did the work of going through and comparing the different chapters and figuring out where we had a, a connection. So thank you for, for all the hard work and everybody. Um, Liz, I think uh, we've talked, so we're ready for questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Henry. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, big round of applause for all of you. Um, you all want to join in that with whether you're on screen or, or have your little Zoom clapping. Um, if you have questions for any of our speakers, you can put them in the chat at any time. You can also raise your hand. Um, and if you're on the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand. Uh, if you want to ask a question anonymously, you can chat me directly. Uh, and I will uh, share that without your name attached. Um, but I'll give everyone a moment to, to reflect and uh, drop those questions in the chat. Okay, we have a question in the chat from Anne Marie asking, how are you all doing outreach to ensure that Alaskans hear about this report and your assessments? So the variety of things that we're we're doing, um, it's always a challenge, but we uh, KTOO wrote a story about us. Rick Toman, who was a technical contributor, wrote a 
a, a blog recently. Uh, we have this webinar. We have another one being run by USGCRP, the US Global Change Research Program in January that has, I think, a, last I heard, a couple hundred people signed up, so that's good. Um, we are running, doing a webinar next week with ACAP, the Alaska Center for Climate Action and Policy or Assessment and Policy at UAF um, to reach a, another audience. And we have a, um, we're part of a uh, panel also with Rick Toman from uh, ACAP at the Alaska Forum on the Environment in February. So we'll we'll be there as well and have a, a, a session to reach the, the Alaska Forum on the Environment audience. You now we've talked about various other things um, and we're looking to see you know, if there are other conferences or events. Um, and if there's something that you have in mind where you think there's a chance for us to come and speak or something, uh, you know, please let me or others with a chapter know. And if one of us can be there, we'd be happy to to uh, to speak or or otherwise spread the word. I also have an offer in, in the chat to do a session through the Department of Energy's Arctic Energy Office. So it'd be another channel for outreach. And we're happy to, happy to do it. Just let us know. Thanks. Um, no, they, this session is fantastic, learning a lot, and it's really great to get to see the faces of the amazing individuals who are working on this. So thank you again for running this, and we'll be back in touch. Hey, got a, another question um, directly to me asking about sort of the next steps, like what happens after this chapter, and, and how can people join in the, the research that comes out of it? Um, well, I think that's a twofold question. I might ask Allison about, uh, you know, I'm sure somebody is somewhere is thinking about NTA six after if you have recovered from NTA five. Um, and then maybe, uh, uh, you know, Colleen or others could talk about the, you know, the, the research that, that helped support things like the, the national climate assessment. But Allison? Yeah, thanks. Um, our immediate next steps are trying to get the word out and make sure that people can access the report. So that's why we have a big webinar series. We're also planning some in-person workshops, regional workshops for 2024. So still um, a lot in the way of communication and outreach. Um, we are starting work on NCA6 already, if you can believe it. Um, so that is hopefully going to be spun up soon. We also are, for the first time ever, uh, uh, creating the first ever national nature assessment. And the call for nominations for authors just went out a couple days ago. So we are seeking authors to participate in the first ever national nature assessment, which it is still in many ways figuring out what, what is a national nature assessment. So uh, by participating, you would get to be part of shaping that answer. And I'll just add a plug that, uh, I mean, Tasks like this are a labor of love in some way, but I think, as you heard from from the, my co-authors and so on, this is it's an interesting exercise to be involved in how to craft that message and what it takes to to put it together. You know, as much as anything, it's what you leave out. We could write volumes. We were started with a ten thousand word limit that expanded to thirteen thousand words later, but you know, we took all of them, and of course, we still left a lot of things that we wish we had been able to spend more time talking about. Um, so as an intellectual exercise, it's really interesting as a chance to collaborate with a bunch of really cool people. It's a, it's a good exercise. So, um, you know, if you have any inclination, I'd encourage you to keep an eye out for those, uh, those opportunities and get involved. Um, Colleen or Larry, I don't know if either of you wants to speak to the sort of research aspect of that question about how people can get involved. Yeah, I can jump in really quick. Um, so this document was interesting for me to work on too, as someone who works at the National Science Foundation, because it is more kind of thinking about the, the world, world implications, not so much the research side of things, but what we're actually seeing on the ground um, with climate change. But I consider this and the entire assessment a foundational document really kind of telling you um, where the science is, where, what the impacts are, what the status is, and using that as kind of a platform to think about your future research questions to come into a proposal at the National Science Foundation or to any of the other agencies that are supporting science or um, policy efforts. So 
I think um, using this document as kind of the 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 inspiration, the the state of what where we are at as of you know November fourteenth when this was published, um, it's a really excellent resource to really think about um, what the next steps are for that. Thanks, and I'll just add. I think that was a great answer, Colleen. I'll just add, I, I really do like the way this chapter was put together because it, it pres presents a perspective from a societal pr impacts perspective that allows us, so for so long in the past, we've been looking at the physical and the biological implications and trying to draw those connections together. But really this is, you know, this is a system-wide change and we really need to understand how a change in one component of the system reverberates through the whole system and impacts other components and other other people in the system, other entities, organizations, and, and responses. And so it's it's really important for us to see this as the holistic impacts. And so I guess what I would say as far as with respect to well, Liz just put in a nice plug with respect to you know joining IRPIC and helping us uh, address some of these changes, but also you know helping us draw these connections between the the cause and effect, effect, effect as far as how this is impacting, you know, Alaska and the Arctic and our nation. And then, but going beyond just the Arctic, but to see, also see how, how the changes in the Arctic are affecting more temperate regions and how those, those changes in the temperate regions are reverberating back up here. So there's, there's plenty of work to do. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And the, the only thing I'd add is that, you know, this is not limited to card-carrying professional scientists. We were delighted on this chapter to have Linda Benkin, who's a commercial fisherman, Alyssa Quinton, who's a community organizer, also involved in, you know, their con contributions and perspective were a huge help. So, um, you know, if, if you're worried about whether you have the right credentials, I think the credential is you care about this and are willing to work together. And then if, if so, there's plenty to do. Um, I do see Larry's question about, uh, uh, you know, having heard an NPR broadcast about meteorologists in the lower 48 getting, um, you know, receiving animosity for for mentioning climate change and so on. Um, to be honest, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought in our public comments we would get a number of people saying, you know, climate change isn't real, that kind of thing. We had a little bit of that in the comments on the outline at the beginning. Um, you know, what do fish have to do with climate change, that kind of thing. But when we got to the, you know, we had uh, 200 something comments. We had a huge number of public comments um, and we didn't really see that. I, in some ways I was kind of hoping, it's like, oh, that's easy stuff to dismiss. But no, we had 280 or whatever substantive comments that we had to pay close attention to and, and think hard about, which was great. Um, I think in one presentation a little while ago, we did have a, um, little question about, I think, you know, we report that Alaska is warming faster than than the global average. And, you know, someone said, oh, but that's not all of Alaska. It's very diverse around the state, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, yes, and. I mean, that's it's true. And the these effects are being felt everywhere. So I, I know the, the idea that if that if that kind of comment is trying to minimize climate change or make us think that, oh, really, it's just a North Slope problem or something, you know, that's, that's really off target. We need to, you know, just be able to point to the, the facts that, you know, this is, we're seeing things all over. Anna, I saw your hand briefly go up before uh, Henry answered that question. Do you have something to add? Um, I don't have anything to add to that question, but one thing that I wanted to acknowledge or something that I thought was that I was I was proud to be part of in this chapter is an acknowledgement of the spiritual side of, you know, the like thinking about the holistic side because we're, we're in here we're like maybe a lot of scientists um, and that's not the spiritual side of things is not necessarily always part of our work and I really wanted to acknowledge that you know in a lot of the chapters of the NCA five you know there's a lot of discussion about spirituality right and how um, climate change is. In, in relationships with the land are spiritual. And, and in our chapter, we, I think are the only mention of the word prayer. 
uh, or pray, you know, praying and and thinking about that. And that is in relation to, you know, Alaska Native elders and, and their practice of that. And that is something that we got a little bit of pushback on as well in the commentary, you know, like, can how can we, how can we have this conversation or have this included in a federal document? And really, you know, one of the important parts from in Northwest Alaska is this, that spiritual side and acknowledging, you know, the relationships that people have with their religious, in religious communities in rural Alaska, which is often a, a central place and would be a place of refuge in, in a disaster, right? There would be a lot of those, that's a lot of our community centers in, in those communities. And so I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, um, regardless of people's belief systems that, you know, um, that was an important part of like recognizing the spiritual nature of, of how climate change can, can impact people. And, um, and that I actually, you know, I got thanks um, from people for that inclusion in our chapter, because it is something that we often um, try to e erase as scientists, um, or like maybe minimize is what I should say. And so I just wanted to, um, to highlight that, uh, because I think it's an important inclusion. Thanks, Kana. Thank you, Kana. Um, we have a question from Jess in the chat, and I'll also pause to remind folks that if you want to ask your question out loud, we totally welcome that. You can just use the raise hand function. Chat is also great. Uh, so a question from, from Jess asking if there have been discussions or plans to make the Alaska chapter or future chapters available in other languages, specifically Alaska Native languages. Or to Allison on that one. Yeah, we are, um, for the first time ever, uh, translating the entire NCA into Spanish. Uh, so that will lag a little bit because we had to get all the English words locked in first before we could send it off to the translators. We're planning on uh, trying to get the overview, the Southwest chapter and the U.S. Caribbean chapter translated, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, and then the rest of the chapters will be translated probably around March or April. We don't have any plans at the moment um, to translate uh, any any other parts of the report into other languages, but um, I have definitely heard that request from a few other places. So it might be an interesting project to take up in 2024. This is the report of record until 2027. So uh, we can keep developing some of these products, um, even though the report's out the door, we can keep going. I guess it, it raises for me a more general question of what we would want to translate. I mean, we can translate the whole chapter, but you know, 13,000 words is, you know, Libby's right, we tried not to make it too technical, but it's not quite, you know, the, the thriller novel riveting read that, um, you know, you might want on your bedside table. Um, you know, is there a summary version? Is there something else that would be would be helpful that would, uh, you know, again, communicate the, the message effectively? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but if people have ideas of, you know, what's worked or what would be helpful in different parts of the state. Um, I'd encourage you to, to think about that and let us know. Henry, can I build on that a little bit? Please. We, um, for the first time, we also developed some podcasts for the assessment and Alyssa Quinton from, from the Alaska chapters interviewed on one of the podcast episodes. And almost last second, we uh, decided to do an audiobook taping of someone reading the overview chapter. Um, and it's early days still, but uh, the first episode of our podcast is the most listened to, but the second most listened to is that audiobook reading of the chapter. Uh, and people said, we, we got a few uh, reviews on the podcast that people really enjoyed, you know, listening to it while they're doing laundry or walking their dog, but they maybe never would have sat down and read the whole chapter. So that might be another way to... Um, translate into another language uh, without it necessarily being on uh, on paper. Great idea. If I could just interject a little bit when thinking about Alaska Native languages, since it's part of my research line, is thinking, you know, a lot of our languages are not like our people's, um, it's, they weren't really a written language to begin with and so it 
is not necessarily one of those things that might be um, necessarily needed or or wanted to to have a full thing like that. But I would assume that in a lot of like we have there's 20 dominant Alaska Native languages in the state, right? That are official Alaska Native languages. But you know, I would um, yeah, I would I would I would say that maybe some of the concepts and and really applying it to cultural aspects would be more of what people would want or like local community, you know, aspects versus, you know, trying to tease out exactly how to say something in Inupaytun, for example. So that would be just something that I would like think about the usability um, in, in the realities of where we're at in Alaska Native communities with regard to our languages. So I'm just gonna put that out there. And I'll, I'll draw attention to Lisa. Lisa made two comments. Lisa, I just saw the second one with Lisa Elena. Um, the first one about you know terminology. I know this is often a challenge of you know a technical term, figuring out the 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 proper translation, but then making that consistent because one translator from one occasion to the next or a, a different translator may translate it differently, and then that can be confusing. Um, and then asking about tribes to use their languages. Yes, I think we'd want to be sure that this was you know, a welcome thing that rather than an imposition. So thank you for raising both of those, Lisa. And along these lines, I'll also note that there's a comment from John um, recommending asking communities what formats they'd prefer, and then also asking um, whether presentations of the chapter would be made to co-management groups or at existing public meetings. Um, again, we're, we're happy to happy to present if, if people would like us. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one one challenge, of course, is that we're all volunteers on this and figuring out, you know, how to how to get the word out and and uh, you know let people know we're available can be time consuming. So again, if you have any suggestions or want to invite us to something, let us know. I'll, I'll piggyback my own question um, while we're talking about this. And maybe it's too early to know, but have you gotten reactions from communities in Alaska in terms of, of the content of the um, report or how it's structured? Any any impressions from communities yet? I have not, but Kena, it sounded like maybe you have. I have, just because I have a little bit of a social media presence, and then also um, I have the opportunity to... Uh, have a newsletter that talks about this kinds of stuff. And so people have, have responded back to me um, a little bit. And yeah, I have, I've heard some, even my mom read the chapter, which was kind of fun. Um, and, and, you know, and one of those, because I was part of it, but one of the, you know, the commentary back was just, it felt like it, it, it was done with care, which was, that's like, I think what people were really it's it's not just like a science treatment, you know, like hairs. Rah. It really meant, you know, there was the plain language, but then there was also all the art, like this beautiful art that was incorporated into into the into the the report itself, and just the idea of like bringing in multiple communities and perspectives into this this piece was really um, valued and noticeable. Um, and as a technical communication scholar, I noticed the usability and the the multiple like I read I read it on my phone, um, which is was cool and it it formatted really well for my phone. So that really was noticeable. And so thinking about multiple points of access, especially in in areas such as rural Alaska, where you know access to the internet is challenging at times and people are using oftentimes their data phone data to be able to to access things on the internet is you know having that ability um, actually makes it much more usable in a lot of ways thanks kana that's great to hear thank you kana uh, charlene your hand is up you can come off mute And if you're looking for the unmute button, it's usually on the far left of your toolbar. Thank you, so 
mute that and then my chips are up in the corner. Uh, my question is for Kana, or for all of you maybe. I don't have a degree in science, but I did take advanced biology and chemistry in high school, took chemistry and physics and biology in college, uh, but I am currently an employee of the Department of Interior BLM at the Alaska State Office. And our network is down, so my supervisor suggested I tune into this program, which I thought would be very interesting because being a resident here in Alaska and having property up near Talkeetna, um, I'm interested in this subject of climate change in the sense that in 1969, as a 13-year-old, I moved to Alaska. We traveled from the border of Canada down south past the glacier at uh, Mount Nuska. And they had old pictures of the Mount Nuska Glacier when the um, uh, homesteaders came in. They were black and white pictures of the Mount Nuska Glacier being quite close to the highway within walking distance. Showed people walking from the um, highway. And now when you go there, it's way back there. I mean, I've flown over it. So I'm not a climate denier, but I guess my question to Kena and to maybe all of you, does your book cover or is it going to cover practical solutions or solutions over time for the problem for Native Alaskans? I know just putting a modern house on tundra and heating it with fuel oil is collapsing the tundra under it. And how do Native Alaskans and other Alaskans find other sources of maintaining their modern lifestyle and not having to revert back to totally Native culture, mud huts and et cetera? I mean, it seems our current government push is to eliminate all fossil fuels and to try to switch to solar and wind. And I know solar in the north is not practical. Wind is not practical in some villages because of the high wind. Um, so I'm wondering, is your book going to deal with some of those practical solutions to the problem? That's the end of my question. I will. You know, you are muted. Oh. Well, thank you for, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely one thing about the NCA five, and I'll let Henry talk about, or 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 Colleen talk about, like some of the limitations of like we can't say this has to happen or whatever, like you know about policy because right, this is meant to inform folks that are making decisions in communities or at various levels, so even in their homes, right? But you know, you're right. You know, when you put any kind of a home right on top of the tundra, you know, it, it does warm it up and that and it's not going to create a long-term solution for for where, you know, foundations, right? But, you know, as far as, you know, how can communities or at the individual level, you know, I'm speaking now as an individual here, but you know, solutions that we have, you know, a lot of things that we need to think about is, you know, like for my community, we do use a lot of fossil fuels for going out hunting, right? Our communities, we use four wheelers and snow goes and boats, right? And we're not, we're not uh, kayaking necessarily for all our hunting, unless you're, you know, my 15 year old nephew, who's like, let's check it out. I want to try it. 
but that's not something that's happening on the day day to day basis in our in our activities and our practices. And you know, because we are part of of some of the things that are exacerbating climate change, or like you know, thinking about that, it doesn't mean that the stakes that we have aren't real. And you know, like our lifestyles and all of us, you know, are live in homes that are heated and live in you know live like have impacts on it. On, on an individual level. But when we think about the bigger policy levels, where we think about bigger issues of how we respond as bigger communities, I think that's where we need to start figuring out and, and coming together in community and cooperating about how to address climate change at bigger scales, rather than thinking about individual, like micro contributions. Um, maybe thinking more on the macro level, um, I think is generative. So that's me as an individual uh, and how I would respond to that. And I'm, thanks, Kate. I'm noticing the time, Liz, and I did see that Ann Jensen was actually raising her hand physically and how retro. Um, but Ann, do we have time for Ann to ask her question? I know some folks have to drop off, but um, yes, Ann, if you, you'd like to quickly ask a question, we can do that one last one. And uh, for folks who are dropping off, this is recorded, so you can you can see that last uh, question. Um, yeah, I'm being retro because I, for some reason, don't have a raise my hand uh, option on here. I, I can. It's anyway. Uh, the question is, and at first, I want to say this is this is a huge improvement. Um, I haven't got the full text yet because I guess it's not really available quite yet to the download, but um, it's a huge improvement over past things and, and other sections because it really does take into account uh the social the cultural implications and how these things are intertwined i mean you know humans are part of the socio-ecological system you know from from microbes on up to you know whatever you want to consider your time your apex predator maybe nano i don't know um us uh is one thing well one thing i, I and it may be in there just didn't come out in the presentation or in the you know um a lot of Alaska indigenous cultures are quite place-based. There are places that are extremely important culturally, uh, tied, you know, to stories tied to whatever, or they're important places for hunting, or they're for, and some of those are being destroyed. Um, and so the, you know, the, I mean, you can't save them. It's it's not doable. We can't save, you know, villages that are eroding. You're not going to save archaeological sites or whatever. But is there any? Does that come up? Because you know, I know there's a lot of push for getting cultural heritage considered expensive, you know, like it copped right now. They're trying to push for inclusion of it in in the next statement. So did it is it in there or can we maybe try to get it in there the next go around? Um we do mention it. I can't remember where. I I know this is one of the observations from the Leo network, and and thanks to Lisa for pointing out, you know, the others like the Indigenous Indigenous Sentinels Network. Um <clears throat> The eroding grave sites came up in a few places, um, and I, we'd we'd had that in an in a an earlier draft of one of the figures, and I'm not quite sure what happened, but I'm pretty sure it's mentioned in the text. So, um, and this again was the challenge of I mean, we could spend our time saying, okay, we, you know, we have this many words. Do we want to briefly mention everything, or do we want to try to hit a few things and recognizing that some stuff is just going to get short trip? Yeah, no, I so, was thinking more in, in the in the full document, not necessarily in the presentation, because it isn't just yeah, no, no, I, talking about it. It's even even no, I, under, <laughs> I understand even in the chapter, those is a sort of a, a limitation. So we we do mention it. It is in there. It's not in there in much depth. Um, and that may be something to think about for the, the next iteration, as you said. All right. Well, otherwise, but just the fact that social cultural stuff got in there is definitely something you should be proud of. Yeah. And I think and the, the whole chapter is available online, but I think you're right that the you know the, uh, the chapter specific PDF is not. And unfortunately Allison left, so I'm not sure exactly when when you can download a chapter. Um, yeah, not not yet. I I well I, I 
let me it's letting me see chapters but it's kind of like unless it's literally the you know when you go to the chapters it's it's literally the it has like the high highlights and then it's got you know read more sections and stuff so is that all there is to it because it doesn't seem like thirteen thousand words yeah well uh, uh seven key messages and introduction yeah. it does add up so it's uh yeah yeah okay maybe it is maybe, you know because yeah. it's, it's all chopped up so it, it just it didn't seem like yeah no, underlying but anyway that, that's fine that's, i'll wait till it i mean it'll show up eventually and i'll read it yep. then but. well liz thank you so much for uh, giving us a an hour here to talk about this we really appreciate it and thank you everybody for being here thank you so much to all of our speakers uh for presenting and, and for putting together this, this fabulous assessment um for folks who joined late uh, or who have colleagues who wanted to, to watch but weren't able to join us, this will be uh, posted on our Epic Collaborations and on our YouTube channel by the end of the week, probably by tomorrow end of day. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Another round of applause for our presenters um, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.